Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia and thank you very much for joining us. I'm Laura Kovacs and I'm honored to be here. The author and co-author of 17 previous books, Tracy Lewis Jiggetts is a professor of English and Black Studies at the Community College of Philadelphia, host of the podcast Heart Talk, and the founder of HeartSpace, a healing community for those who have experienced trauma. Her new essay collection is a celebration of Black joy as a means of restoration, resilience, and resistance. Tonight, she'll be joined in conversation with Bernice McFadden, winner of the American Book Award and the NAACP Image Award for Outstanding Literary Work for the Book of Harlan, among much other work. Thank you both so much for joining us. The screen is all yours. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> Tracy, Pretty. happy pub day to you. Thank you. Book Thank you so 18. much. Congratulations. Yes. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. I am so grateful. Just full today. <laughs> I'm full right along with you. Um, so let's just jump right on in. Sure. I found Black Joy to be a remarkable collection. One that spoke to me in a very intimate way. It was like sitting with one of my sisters and listening to these stories. So thank you for this gift. Um, I'd like to know what the motivation was behind this book. And why do you think it was necessary to birth it into the world at this time? Hmm. Oh, thank you for saying that. First of all, you know, I always tell everyone that I have favorites, favorite writers. And so you are one of the ones that I just hold up to such just in the light all the time. Every, I mean, I'm so grateful that I get the chance to talk to you. Um, so thank you so much. Um, Black Joy came from my own journey of trying to figure out what joy felt like in my body. Um, thinking about grief and carrying grief and trauma, um, I had a therapist who said to me, Tracy, you know, what does joy feel like to you? And at my big age of 40 something, <laughs> I couldn't answer her. And I, I knew that I had had joy moments, but like I couldn't pinpoint what it actually felt like, nor could I access it, you know, at any time. So that began just a long journey of, you know, uh, self-awareness, trying to figure out what it felt like. And I had, I talk about this in the book, I had this moment of um, watching a popular nighttime drama television show and like feeling my body energized and you know as a storyteller like we are you know captured by good story right like and we're drawn to it and you know all of the layers and everything so i was just sitting in the room like <laughs> like that and my husband walks in and he's like um yeah, don't know what's happening here. You should be alone. <laughs> so, but I, um, but I just, I, 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 you know, took a moment and took a beat and like noticed how my body was feeling. And I was just like, had this revelation, like, oh, this is what joy feels like. And I took a snapshot, you know, a mental snapshot, a screenshot of that and brought it back to my therapist. And my therapist was like, now you have a point of reference. You know what it feels like in your body. And so when you are in, you know, your state of anxiety or, you know, triggered, your PTSD is triggered or you're dealing with grief or any of those things, you have something you can access now. It does not mean it's going to take it away, but it can right size you when you're feeling like you're falling. So then that just, you know, that became me just paying attention, right? And swinging with my daughter or dancing with my daughter in the rain and like just really grabbing hold of these moments of joy um and of course as someone who's a writer i started writing about it um and that led that just you know kind of snowballed into what we have here today <laughs> have you met other people in your life who have not experienced joy in the way that you discovered it 
Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I think um, simultaneously, and I know you appreciate this because I know like the work, you know, how you approach your writing, you've talked about that, is that simultaneously while I'm discovering joy, I'm doing a lot of genealogical work and I'm unpacking, you know, I found my third great grandmother, you know, in the plantation where she was held captive, right? And I just began to kind of sit with her and sit with those generations and thinking about my mother and thinking about my grandmother. I apologize. I think there's like the fan situation going on my computer. Um, but like, you know, sitting with that and trying to discover joy and trying to remember where I seen it, right? Uh -huh. And um, realizing that it's always been there for all of us, all of these women in my family, but accessing it or um, accepting it ha had been a challenge, right? Uh -huh. um, with its trauma and pain and hardship seemed to be the most familiar, right? And um, so, yeah, I, I, I have seen people, I have seen people who aren't, weren't able to tap into like the somatics of it, like the, the embodied piece of it. I think this is going to be a guide for them to do that. Mm. Why was it important for you to birth this book into the world at this moment? Because we are living in precarious times. Absolutely. Um, you know what, I wanted to use what I was discovering my personal story as an entry point to look at the way black folks um, as a collective have wielded joy, right? How, how we've used joy. And I know the catchphrase nowadays is black joy is, is resistance, right? Like that's what we hear. And it absolutely positively is but even more so what I've discovered, I think the emphasis that this book has is that it's, it's been the mechanism, it's been the mode for healing, right? It's been the way that we've healed, you know, ourselves in the midst of everything that's going on in the world. And I think that is incredibly important for the time that we're in now between a global pandemic, glo you know, uh, racial un unrest and uprisings and protests and, you know, you know, voting rights acts, you know, like all of that, right? It's, it's chaos that's happening around us. Um, yet in the middle of a protest in Philadelphia, somebody gets married and somebody starts singing and somebody starts dancing. And we've been doing that, right? There's an essay in the piece called, you know, we've been known, right? <laughs> we, we've been knowing how to do this. Right. And we just didn't have the language, right, around it. We didn't necessarily have, you know, nobody was talking about, you know, grandmama rocking in church and that's bilateral stimulation, right? And she's actually moving trauma through her body by rocking back. Nobody's, no, nobody's framing that way because why would we? Mm -hmm. But that's what it is. Um, and so I th I'm hoping that this would be a bomb or, you know, something that would people can connect to their own lives, like connect to their own story. It's like, oh yeah, I've seen that before. Oh yeah, that, I've been through that and that's kind of like how I deal with joy or not deal with joy, right? right? And, and begin the conversation. So that to me is like the most important gift I could give. Oh, and we're very grateful. Thank you. Would you share an excerpt with us? Yes, Please. I will. Um, so I, I started that off with a, you know, sort of like the standard intro from the introduction kind of thing that I was going to read because I thought that's what I was supposed to do. But I'm a little rebellious. <laughs> so um, I was sitting quiet waiting for this to get started and I just felt an overwhelming presence. And I feel like it's probably best to start with something else um, that speaks to that presence. So um, this is a piece titled um, I've got dreams to remember granny. Unvagio in cinque parti, which is Italian for journey in five parts. My granny called me Petey. I can hear her raspy elongation of the E vowel in my head even now. How's my sweet Petey? 
It simultaneously unravels and soothes my soul to hear those words pierce the dimensions of heaven and earth. The rivers of gold she crossed more than 11 years ago. The story goes that the name stuck because my pint sized self would run around her house screaming over and over again, for Pete's sake, granny. I don't know where I got it. I suppose it was one of those phrases that you just that just tasted good to the toddler palate. I'm sure the staccato sharpness of Pete tickled my little fancy and sounded like something an adult would respond to with laughter and kisses. And so I added the phrase to my growing repertoire of phrases like mommy said and I want applesauce. I spoke very early and much of that can be attributed to my granny. She was my sitter for the first three years of my life while my mom went to work and she did not do baby talk. She spoke to me with the same tone and tenor and mostly the same language she used with Miss Violet, one of her uber fly girlfriends who came over to smoke cigarettes and drink beer with her. Miss Violet was a beautiful woman whose face stayed beat to the gods as makeup artists say today. Granny and Miss Violet would cackle about men and there was usually one in particular who would occupy at least a portion of their conversations, Victor Newman. Victor was the ruthlessly vicious yet debonair lead character on the soap opera, The Young and the Restless. Yes, Victor and Marvin Gaye and Smokey Robinson were always in the mix with the ordinary Oscars and regular Richards. I at once knew all this and I didn't. I was two, maybe three years old. So my witness is probably not the best. Do I really even know what my granny and her girlfriends were talking about? Maybe not. But I did, but I did the math and she was 39 when I was born, several years younger than I am now. So I'm quite sure that they weren't talking about Mighty Mouse or the Wampa Room. And when blood memory jumps wildly in my veins, whenever I hear a Sam Cooke or Supremes or Aretha Franklin record, when Otis Redding croons, I've got dreams to remember, I know for sure they weren't. I mostly just recall the laughter the way they'd unleash whoops and hollers that would soar through the room and wrap me up in joy. I'm grown now, so of course I know the backstories, the divorces and wayward children, the job losses and gains. Granny's house was filled with a generationally familiar prepackaged happiness. The laughter, whether from a kiki with her girls or a raucous win at backgammon was never a surprise. It was a known glee. Granny was neither spontaneous nor vulnerable then, mostly because life wouldn't allow her to be. Bouts with depression had long snatched Granny's breeze from under her wings. She chose her own sovereignty and preferred her happy to be one of her own design. Even better if it came in a bottle or a pill or mink coat. Her concept of freedom and happiness would always be the glamorous shade of red that offered a quick pop of color against the stark drabness of life. It could never ever be the whole picture. But back then, to my three-year-old heart, her laughter just sounded like love and safety. Her presence energized my little body. Every moment creating neural pathways my soul would need to hold on to when life went left. The evenings watching Star Trek on the couch tucked under her arm. The days watching her paint the ceramic figurines she'd spun and carved herself. My three-year-old self sucking on the fatty gristle of the T-bone steak she made every week. The smell of sterling beer and Virginia Slim cigarettes. The coffee mugs with cherry red lipstick stains and the clanking of silver hoop earrings and bangles. Right there in her Bent Creek apartment, I first felt the power of a kind of joy, even if sporadic and disjointed, that fights off demons with skill and style. I was Viola Brown's grandchild and she loved me. Ooh, that was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Do you need a minute? You need a <laughs> I'm okay. Tracy, there's so much reflection in these pages. Thanks. I want to know what perspectives or beliefs have you challenged with this work? Ooh, Bernice, Bernice, Bernice. <laughs> um, so much, um, so much related to my own understanding of faith and spirituality. Um, you know, I, I, I 
you know, from the age of 11 on, I grew up in the Black Baptist Church in Louisville, Kentucky, right? And um, there's so much good there, right? Like I have grace for the, you know, the elders and the people that I, that kind of laid the foundation of my understanding of the divine. Mm. There was also a lot of things that could be categorized as respectability politics or, you know, any other, you know, language that's used nowadays, right? But we're just really um, internalized racism and misogyny kind of wrapped in, you know, theology. Yeah. And so I've been challenged by that. I've been challenged about how much, how I'm able to hold my faith and my spirituality um, and all, and also, right? Um, deconstruct or detach from the things that are no longer useful. Like my great grandmother used to say, you know, uh, take the meat and spit out the bones, right? And so that I think that is evident in the book. Um, there are, you know, t conversations that I have with myself in the book about um, the language of deconstruction or the language of faith and spirituality. Um, so that's one piece. I think also. Um, my understanding of a black woman, uh, my role, so to speak, of as a black woman, um, my identity as a black woman has shifted and changed um, in the process of writing this book um, in ways that I did not expect. Um, what I want my daughter to see, what I want her to know about what it means. Um, the book is dedicated to her because there is a level of freedom in her that I see that feels unattainable to me. Mm. And um, I can on one hand say I've given her the space to be that. On the other hand, I can long for that too. And so just wrestling with that, you know, the, the ideas that I had about, you know, who I am and what I'm supposed to be have been challenged through the writing of this book in a good way, I think, in a, in a way that's going to spur on my evolution so yes. i think that's like to be continued <laughs> thank you for that now i'm gonna read a passage uh -oh. this jumped out at me okay. um, and i've read it a few times okay okay when we choose blackness which as i've stated here might mean choosing unacceptance it's glorious. When we decide to wrap our arms tight around what Blackness means to us, hold it, love it, and yes, even interrogate it, then we snatch that construct out of the hands of those who thought they had the power to use it to make us inferior. We say, give me that Blackness and let me show you what I will do with it. Let me roll it between my fingers and in my mind. Let me set your intentions on fire and create something new, something that as colonizers, you'll desperately want later on. Let me create the baseline that holds your national melody together. I see you coming to steal it, but as soon as you do, I'll flip it again and you will need to overhaul your systems just to catch up. I will turn my gospel into blues, into jazz, into R&B, into rock, into funk, into disco, into hip hop. You'll look back over entire industries and when you remove the mask, you'll, see, you'll only see our joy behind the creativity. We will lean into your non-acceptance, no matter how much it hurts, because deep down we know that on your best day, you could never. We're sad if you don't like or love us. We're not sad if you don't like or love us. We have our oyster knives. I love that nod to Zora. Mm -hmm. When did you choose Blackness? I think that I have been always choosing Blackness with whatever understanding I had in a particular moment, right? I remember being in um, high school. I, I, actually, if you pull out my yearbook, 
um, from senior year next to my name, it says little X, right? I always had <laughs> this very militant, you know, um, and, I, and I don't know, you know, we, they called it militant, but I don't know it was that. It was just an understanding of and, and celebration of who I was as a Black person. Still with all the stuff, right? I just talked about like being in the church and all like still with all the the, the limited understanding, um, but seeking, constantly seeking to understand who I was as a black woman. And that, you know, went to college and that developed at, um, you know, hanging out. I'll never forget, I'm talking to Frank X Walker on Friday because I used to hang out in the King Cultural Center in these in this small room that was in the back and they had all of these books, the Zora Neale Hurston, like all of these books. And I was just like, oh, it was like I was breathing in all of them, right? Um, still with issues, right? Still with major issues around wanting to be accepted, right? Wanting um, hyper aware of the gaze, like that Toni Morrison talked about the white gaze, right? Like hyper aware of it and wanting to, you know, somehow be black, but and also like, you know, have this acceptance and, you know, moving, leaving the bluegrass, they leave in Kentucky and going to Chicago and going to New York and going to Philly, going into these metropolitan areas where, you know, black folks are black folks, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, observing, taking it in. So I've always been choosing blackness um, from the very beginning. I, I, I just had a memory of my mom you know, my, my mom had Essence Magazine and, and uh, Ebony Magazine and uh, Song of Solomon. That's what book I specifically remember because it had a yellow cover on it. And it was Song of Solomon. And I'm literally maybe 10, right? I had no business, but there I am trying to, trying to <laughs> read, you know? So there was this um, hunger, um, to see myself outside of the paradigms, outside of like whiteness. Mm -hmm. um, but then hearing, oh, you gotta go get a good job. Oh, you gotta, you know, you gotta go and uh, hearing that language and trying to make sense of it. I think it was within the last decade, I'd say in the last 10 years where I tell people all the time, my code switching button is broken. Like, I don't, I don't know if it works. And I mean, maybe it works. I don't know if it works anymore. <laughs> you know, especially working in academia, like it don't work. Y'all gonna get all of this, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, um, yes. you know, I think within the last decade or so, just because it's exhausting, number mm -hmm. one, it's exhausting to trying to constantly be accepted by an entity. Not, and, and to be clear, you know, I probably shouldn't even give this disclaimer, but I'm not talking about individuals. I'm talking about the collective, right? To, to be accepted by a collective that really has no intention of accepting me in the fullness of who I am. That's my hair, that's my body, that's my, you know, the way I speak, you know, if I drop a G, at, you know, <laughs> you know, whatever, you're not really interested in making that, normalizing any of that. Mm -hmm. So why am I trying? Right. Right. And the joy I have is, is something that I found in stopping trying. Now, I say all of that, but I also recognize that that is a kind of a privileged standpoint because there's some people that, you know, look, I got to take this job. I got kids to feed. You know what I'm saying? And so I'm going to I'm going to do what I got to do to. To, you know, make do right. Mm -hmm. I just, I think for me, in my circumstances, in my situation, I just got tired of making do because making do felt such a compromise to my spirit and to my soul. Um, and again, I'm a work in progress. So I will be choosing blackness every day and every iteration of that as I learn more, as I gain more. Like I said, the genealogical work has blown my mind. You know, when I think about my third great grandmother on a plantation outside of Wilmington, North Carolina, and what she must have seen and how she must have lived, but then how they ended up, when I think about how they ended up in Kentucky or how they ended up in these in Virginia and all of these different places and the journeys that they like, 
it's blown my mind and it's given me a new dimension to my blackness that I didn't have before I took the DNA test and it told me that my people was the Yoruba people from, you know, Nigeria, yes. right? Yes. Or, you know, before I took, you know, before I started to do that work. So I don't know if I answered your question. Yes, you did. <laughs> but I'm I'm I am choosing, actively choosing. I think we have to. I think especially if you're in the Western hem hemisphere, you have to choose blackness every single day. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like when you are sitting down looking at these documents that have to do with your family, that you're not just looking at them, that you're having the experience and you're having the conversations with them? That's how I feel. I'm always yeah. having a conversation with an ancestor. And, and I listen to them because they do guide me in the right direction. Yes, I mean, I, I'm at the beginning of that journey. And I think in the beginning, I had to set it aside because it freaked me out a little bit. <laughs> you know, um, I believe in the power of the great cloud of witnesses, right? Like I believe in their presence. Um, but as I began to see the documents that 14 year old, you know, sold for $500, like when I started looking at those documents, um something else happened <laughs> and i am in the process of making sense of it mm -hmm. i don't know if i'm making sense of it I've, I've made sense of it yet and i think i'm in the process of embracing those conversations um because they have something to say to me oh yeah oh absolutely i think it's probably connected to my next piece of writing <laughs> <Bernice>. <laughs> and i'm just like oh so before we started speaking in front of the audience, mm -hmm. we had a very tiny conversation. And you, this is book 18. Mm -hmm. And you said you feel as nervous as you did with book one. Mm -hmm. And I'd like you to elaborate on that. Um, you know, exactly 20 years ago, 2002, I put together this little chat book of poetry called Collapsed on the Wings of a Sigh, um, a, a, a compilation of poems I'd written over the years. Um, and I couldn't see Black Joy. There's no way I could have saw Black Joy. And I, I would say that I am even more nervous than I was at book one. I think book one, I just, I didn't know what I was, I didn't know what I was doing. So I was just doing it. You know, there was a free, I was liberated in a way that I'm trying to access now, right? Because I just did it. I just put my work out in the world. Like I just did it in like, you like it, great. If you don't, okay. You know, um, I've probably been jaded a little bit about by the industry in a lot of ways. Um, and so I, I have a lot of preconceived notions. I, I spent a lot of time as an independent, um, had my own publishing company, published other folks, published my work. I did um, publish with a small independent press, one book. Um, and then I've been doing a lot of collaborations with high, high profile folks. Um, but Black Joy is like my first venture out into what some would call mainstream. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I hear a lot of it's your time, it's your time, it's your season. And I receive that wholeheartedly. Um, and also, <laughs> I feel I'm still wrestling with feeling deserving of it and feeling worthy of it. And, you know, and I've people had people say, like, you've been doing this for 20 years. <laughs> You know, you've been, I mean, I've sat in your classes before. You've taught, you know, in Philly and I've gleaned from you and I've gleaned from so many of the writers that I absolutely love that make me want to throw my laptop out the window because y'all just so damn good <laughs> at what you do. Um, but I just kept going because I feel called to this, right? I feel called. Um, and I'll, I also think that I am particularly nervous now because so much of me is in this book. Mm -hmm. 
so mm. much of my story is in this book. I put, I bled on them pages. I believe and, that. <laughs> and that's, you know, that's different for me than writing fiction. It's different than, you know, writing an essay or, or a reported piece or something like that. Like memoir or autobiographical essays or personal essays, it's, it's an entirely different ball game. I'm exposing myself to the world and I'm saying, I don't need your acceptance. Right. <laughs> But I, but I'm in a business that needs, needs everybody that's listening to go buy the book, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. how do I hold that? You know, it's, so I think that's where I am now. It's balance, I think. Yeah. I, I feel that because, you know, I'm working on my memoir right now and I've written about these women who raised me and that was easy. Mm -hmm. And now the last section is about myself and I'm, I've written about myself um, hiding. I've written about myself under the guise of fictional characters. Yes. So just to say, well, you know, I did this and this, this, this. It's very difficult because I feel like I don't care what you think, mm -hmm. but the the little girl inside of me yes. is like. I, I care. So it's, Absolutely. yeah, it's terribly difficult, but you did it. Yeah, I, I saw some of the blood on the pages <laughs> <laughs> and the tears. And mm -hmm. I think that's what makes a really phenomenal piece of work is the truth and the honesty. I'm all about truth and honesty. And I could always tell when a writer is not being completely truthful. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm like, don't dip your toe in, mm -hmm. jump in. Yeah. That's it. And I, th I'm glad you said that because that is where I was. I felt like all of my other kind of transparent writings, the blogging that I did was like the dipping of the toe, testing the waters. Right. You know what I mean? And this, I, I committed, I said, I, I want to hold the truth sacred. Um, I want it my POV to be my POV mm -hmm. and I want to go all in and you know I did my best to do that and it was scary um I remember reading a, a piece to my husband and, and he was like are you sure <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you want to put that out there he's like it couldn't be me but go ahead <laughs> you know the the and it was a piece about my first love and you know so he's like, that's a lot, <laughs> you know, but I think intention matters, right? Like, I think if I was writing and I've seen, you know, I know you've seen it. I've seen this where, you know, people are writing to spill the tea, right? right? And, or, you know, to revenge writing, right? Like I'm going to get back at everybody who hurt me. Um, I tried my best to hold space for and grace for anyone in my life that may have harmed me, but who, you know, indirectly I needed to tell the story. Um, and that was not easy for me at all. But I tried So you it. wrote it out. You mm -hmm. wrote it out the way it was, right? The way it happened, how you feel. But the writing is in the rewriting. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So in the rewriting, you know, that's when I got to reframe and that's where the reflection happens. Mm. Like, that's what I realized. Like, that's where, that's where I got, a re, you know, the revelations about certain circumstances was in the rewriting. You know, I can, I can dump it on the page. Absolutely. Put all of the righteous rage that I had on the page. But then when I went to, you know, work on it, I was able to see some stuff that I would not have been able to see if I had just left it there. Right. Yeah. And so I think that's important also for real. You have to step away. So we've got some questions. Mm. Um, Madam Donna Hill is in the house. Hey. And she asks, being this is a personal story, how did you manage to have your truths edited for publication? So you kind of sort of answer that but it goes through your own personal editing but there are other eyes on the page yeah. 
So yeah, I mean, the the beautiful thing, like I said, I had, I don't know, I don't want to say it's a unique experience because I surely hope it was not unique, but I had a really um, wonderful editor um, who um, was a white woman, Karen Marcus, a uh, great editor. Um, I know Karen. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, <laughs> what, what, what she said to me is like, I'm not going to pretend to know the experiences of a black woman. So she actually brought in someone who worked at, you know, as an editor to sit, you know, and there were like phrases where she would correct and they were like, oh, no, no, she means, you know, she fine, <laughs> you know, You've come a long way mm. for you to have that experience. We have come a long way. Wow. Um, that, and I was actually shocked because, you know, I, I listened to everyone who had told me be conscious. I was prepared to defend, you mm -hmm. know, and, you know, I was fortunate enough where I, I was able to tell my story pretty much the way that I wanted to tell it, you know, minus just some like craft type of things and organizational kinds of things. Um, and I'm so grateful for that because I do know that that's not something that is always the case for folks so i feel like i was sheltered I, th I think the reason why i had to read the piece about my grandmother because i feel like uh i been in the process all along <laughs> in some way she may have told somebody like listen uh don't mess with my baby <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know so i i didn't i you know i had a i didn't have a lot of now, if the question is around my fears of someone else reading my stuff, there was a lot of that. Um, but I figured like, hopefully thousands of people are gonna be reading it. So if I can't get around the class, tens, huh? of, tens of thousands. Tens of thousands of people <laughs> are going to be reading it. So I better get used to it. <laughs> um, Bonnie question is what other writers do you see black joy in that speaks to you that's a great question um well i'm talking to one <laughs> i am talking uh like i'm always like you know i i'm i i believe in giving people their flowers while they're here and you know we've lived these last few years where we've seen what can happen when we don't do that. So I, I, I always, people are like, you know, what book would you tell me to read to really kind of Gathering of Waters, Glorious, Book of Harlan? Like I'm <laughs> like, I'm, like these, these are the standards. Um, I think Jasmine Ward is amazing. Um, yes. And just the, the beauty of the language It's like, um, I'm black, so I'm I'm reading it like I'm listening to a good song, like, mm, <laughs> like yes, <laughs> you know, you better do that, you know. Um, I mean, I mean, there's the Godmother, Toni Morrison. Yeah. Um, um, I was, you know, almost excited about her short story book coming I, out. Mine came today. Mine came today too, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I was like, oh. Is that a sign? It came the same day as my book came out, you know? Um, there are connections everywhere. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I received that. Um, yeah, so I mean, if I, I mean, I hate naming names because there's so many people out there that I think that are just brilliant. Um, but yeah, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> uh, Nicole asks, you talked about your daughter and your family history. How do you share that with her? And what do you hope she does with, with that information in the future when she thinks about her family? Mm -hmm. um, I haven't talked, to be honest, my daughter's 10. So I have not talked a lot about like the, the backstories, right? About my... Uh, family and, and and just our our um history as women um in our family um but i do i said this yesterday to someone that i'm a i i had a vision or kind of an imagining of my daughter at 25 you know and she's reading black joy maybe for the first time because she can't read it now <laughs> i mean I, I i need some i need to hold on to something for a second <laughs> But um, although she's begging me, she begs me every day to read it. Um, 
but I, I have this vision of her reading it at 25 and just feeling a sense of like place mm. um, and feeling a sense of wholeness in a way that maybe she hadn't experienced prior to that. Um, and I, you know, as she uh, matures and grows, I absolutely will be sharing with her the story because um, I think that's the disconnect, right? Like I, like many Black folks grew up where where silence was normalized, where hiding was normalized, where you didn't talk, you don't air your dirty laundry, you don't talk about what goes in this house, stays in this house, don't you say nothing out, you know? Like, and so I don't want to perpetuate that. Um, I, I want her to see that it's okay um, to share her heart and to share her story. And so that, I hope that I can get to that place where I can really talk to her about it when she gets older. And she's 10? She's 10. You might have to break down by the time she's 12 and let her read the book. <laughs> were you, were you censored? Did your parents censor you, censor the literature? Um, um, was I think they tried to. Okay. <laughs> You know, like I said, I read everything. It didn't matter. My mom had Essence, Cosmopolitan, Toni Morrison, you know, whatever was on Alice Walker, The Color Purple, you know what I'm saying? Like whatever. And I snuck and read it. And I now in hindsight, I low-key think that my mom knew <laughs> that I was reading it, you know, and was just let it ride because, you know, she's reading. Um, uh, but I was censored in other ways. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I mean, I grew up, you know, by the time I was in middle school, it was heavily in the church. So, you know, that's not no fingernail polish, no makeup, you know, what right. are you listening to? You know, that, that, you know, music, you shouldn't be listening to that hippity hippity hop, you know? <laughs> and meanwhile, I got earphones on the bus listening to NWA, like, you know, <laughs> strawberry, strawberry was the neighborhood. <laughs> you know? and so... Yeah, um, I don't I don't censor her. Um, I just think that um, I have to ready myself for the questions. Yes, that is true. Oh, OK. So Tanil asks, what is on your Black Joy playlist? Oh, mm, all the things. Um, I mean, can you have a Black Joy playlist and not have like a Frankie Beverly and Maze? Absolutely you, not. <laughs> I mean, like, does that even like, you know? Um, so like old school or what they would call old school, um, Frankie Beverly, and, I mean, everything. I put together actually a, a Black Joy playlist on, um, I gotta kind of figure that out because it's on Spotify. And so I don't know. <laughs> what I'm gonna do about that now, right. <laughs> but but um, you know it was um, you know everything from Miles Davis and jazz to and bitches brew to um, Frankie Beverly and Maze and Marvin Gaye to you know early hip hop right like LL and Eric B and Rakim to um, Beyonce. Cause I just feel like whatever you think about it, she gonna have to be on the playlist, right? right. Um, right. Um, you know, to you know, newer artists that are coming out now that are maybe not as known. There's a song, and gosh, I forgot her name, called "I Am Enough" that I just play over and over again. I've been mm -hmm. playing it all over again in this last week to remind myself that I am enough. Um, so yeah, um, all genres because as you read, Bernice. We own all the genres. Yes, we do. So yes. <laughs> I have all of it is black. <laughs> okay, Katrina, your experiences and sentiments with your daughter and your granny deeply resonates with me. I share deeply in that black joy. I have a son and three grandsons. What are your thoughts about the male experiences and conversations of black joy? Yeah. I think that, I don't want to say even more so, but equally, I think Black men really, um, I would love for to see them really embrace the embodiment, the embodying that happens with Black joy, to really understand what's happening in their bodies, right? Mm -hmm. um, and particularly since their bodies are such um, 
a perceived threat. Um, and so you almost like I, you know, I imagine, you know, in my hopes and dreams that a brother that's reading this book would, you know, hear my story of like figuring out what joy feels like. And then when he's getting pulled over, can access it, uh. like can access it, you know, even if it's on his own mind. Right. Um, and, you know, as we know, there's still no guarantee. Right. But at the same time, um, I think from a mental health standpoint, an emotional health standpoint, a spiritual health standpoint, um, black men could really use the somatic portion of like joy of the joy. Like, um, I mean, and I, I've said this, like, I feel like over and over today, but like joy by itself is simply like this this physiological firing off of hormones you know in our body the dopamine the serotonin or whatever right. in response to pleasure mm-hmm. right that's you know well all it is black joy is all of that you know but it's a demonstration of our humanity right it's a demonstration it is that's the resistance piece you dehumanize me you know my humanity shows up right, right. in the form of joy and i just you know i would love a more specific tangible so to the person who's asking this question like in what ways can you your grandsons you know make them conscious of when they're happy when they're having a joy moment can you say how do you feel right now when they dunk the basketball right like how do you feel right now tell me what it feels like yeah make them aware make them speak back to you about what they're feeling so they have words for that joy in their body because when you're not around and they're confronted with something, which inevitably they will, they have words for not just the joy, but every other emotion too. Absolutely, thank you. Um, Donna is asking another question. What was the most challenging portion to write or grapple with and how did you get beyond it? Mm. I mean, my my first inclination is to say that the most challenging was my uh, discussion of my sexual abuse and sexual assault. But at the same time, I feel like I have talked about that, that and that's the toe dipping that I've done mm-hmm. and other work. So I think, honestly, the hardest, most challenging portions was the one that I read today. Um, the ones that have to do with my lineage, Mm. um, the people that have passed on, my aunt Vicky, my grandmother, my great grandmother, the great time traveler who would take me to 1908 Alabama or 1912 Alabama. Like, you know, you know, she jumped me in her rocket ship, you know, with her stories and we ride out, you know, um, those were the hardest because I think I had to sit in the grief. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, Cynthia Bradley, congratulations to you. I am researching my ancestors through Ancestry.com, the Yoruba Orishas, and the data compiled by the Mormons. I have always found joy in the things you mentioned about your grandmother. I still do. I dance and sing every day. My phrase at a party is, is it time to play Frankie Beverly yet? (laughs) (laughs) My request I give as your take, my request I give as your take on Zora Neale Hurston. Um, Well, I guess what maybe she's saying, what is your take on Zora Neale Hurston? um, The one thing that I love about Zora is, um, you know, kind of what we were talking about earlier about her being unflinching in our language right and in choosing to write in dialect and choosing to write in our language and and um i just find that incredibly i hate to use the word courageous because it shouldn't be courageous right but in light of At the, the time, time right like in light of the time in which she was writing it was incredibly courageous right it was literally the embodiment of what i'm talking about when i say you know, my code switching button is broken or I am going to no longer contort myself to the system. So I think, you know, there's a million things I love about Zora, but that's one of them. Um, 
congratulations to you, Tracy. This is from um, Miss Denise Turner in Newton, Mass. And Denise, you can reach me on my <laughs> website. Um, oh. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, she was at, Cynthia said, what do you like or dislike about Zora? So, okay. um, Raina, how do you or can someone else push joy forward when pain slash trauma seems to overshadow it? Mm -hmm. um, I can answer that by like sharing a little bit of a recent experience. Um, I was in conversation with my therapist, um, Black woman. And she was saying to me, Tracy, I think, because I, I wrestle with fear, right? Like I am, um, because of post-traumatic stress syndrome, fear is this ever-present thing. Yes, ever-present in my body and in my mind. And, um, and what she said was like, uh, you've been brave in the background. Because I've always been like, when I say that I have fear, people will say, what girl, you you left Kentucky and you moved on your own, you move and you did this and you wrote this book and you left this job and you did all of that. But I was operating in a lot of ways with, you know, yes, making these courageous moves, but fear was always in the forefront, right? And a lot of times what they, what they observed as me kind of stepping out was actually me running from <laughs> you know, um, and, and so, but my therapist said, it feels like your fear and your courage is about to shift places, which means your fear, it's not going anywhere because you have a history, you have a, you know, you've lived, right? So it's not going anywhere, but your courage is going to take center stage, yes. right? And your fear, it will still be there, but now it has to go to the, the background. And so I would say that you know, Raina, hey, Raina, um, <laughs> I, um, I work every day at being conscious and present in my decision making and asking myself who's driving the bus, mm -hmm. the language that my, you know, my therapist does use, like who is driving, is eight-year-old Tracy driving the bus? Is 15 year old Tracy driving the bus? Is 25 year old Tracy driving the bus? Is 35 year old Tracy? Or is 46 year old Tracy driving the bus? Me today. Right. Who is driving? Because it, depending on who's driving, will be what, you know, they each have an agenda, they each have a, a need for safety in a different way. Right. And so I think it's important with every decision to to really be intentional about asking yourself who is in the driver's seat. And if the healing, not healed, but healing version of yourself, the, the most recent version of yourself is in the is in the driver's seat, then you can choose joy even in pain, they live side by side. It's not about, you know, can I get rid of the pain and put the joy they can live together. They, yeah, grief they can. and joy are in the same container. I just want to remind everyone that there are signed books with signed book plates available for purchase. So please make sure you do that. We have five minutes left. I want to read something. This is the first post that I read this morning. Okay. And I was like, perfect post <laughs> uh, from Dr. Yaba Blay. Mm -hmm. And she said, to call me Black is one of the most beautiful, incredible compliments you could ever give me. Yeah. And I said, what a way to start my day, to start Black History Month, to, um, you know, th to start this, the, the hours that span between waking up and being here with you. Mm -hmm. it's, it's powerful. Like, very powerful. It it's the, I mean, that, that statement is the evidence of the alchemy that we do as black people, because, you know, this name, this, you know, being called black, you know, means something else to dominant culture. Yes. Right? So to decide it to say, 
nah, baby, that's what you not black. I mean, like, you know, Sorry for like, you. <laughs> like to own <laughs> that and to live in that and to love that with, you know, all of the complexities of humanity, you know what I'm saying, that live there is a kind of alchemy that we do daily when we choose that, when we choose blackness, as you said, every day we're transforming what, you know, has been said about us into a reality that is for me glorious. Absolutely. I think on that note, <laughs> we can say goodbye. I want to thank the library and Tracy, thank you so very, very much. Thank you. Um, wonderful collection. I'm looking forward to the next book. I want to learn more about Grammy. Yeah. Uh, thank you everyone that came out tonight. Mm -hmm. Hope you all stay safe. Any final words, friend? Um, I am just so incredibly blessed um, to get to talk about Blackness, to get to talk about Black joy. It is an absolute privilege, and I am so grateful. I'm grateful to you. Thank you, uh, Bernice, just for agreeing to talk with me. Thank you, Free Library of Philadelphia. I feel like I'm on like the Grammys. Like, I'm, first I want to thank, first I'm going to first give an honor to God, who's the head of my life. <laughs> You know, <laughs> but yes, I thank everyone for coming out and, you know, just uh, I'm hoping that the book blesses you. Lovely. Everybody stay safe. Have a good evening. Thank you, Free Library. Thank you. Kisses. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye. -bye.